Sound Words, Christian Magazine, Volumes 41 to 50. Republished by Irving Risch, host of Down to Earth That Heavenly Minded Podcast. Exodus, The Book of Redemption and Relationship. A. Shepherd. We will go through the entire book in 24 parts. Part 21 of 24. Exodus chapter 23 and 24. The first verse of chapter 23 deserves careful consideration, since it makes the hearer of a report responsible to ensure that what he has heard is true before accepting it, the true rendering of the verse being, Thou shalt not accept a false report. How necessary it is to give heed to such a solemn admonition. The words of the Lord Jesus, take heed what ye hear, though referring to an entirely different matter, are of the utmost relevance to what we are considering. James, in his epistle, warns us of the unruliness of the tongue, using extremely strong terms to describe its unruly propensities and its defiling and destructive consequences. The heart actuated by the wisdom that is from above, which is pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, James chapter 3 verse 17, will take heed not only to what it hears, but also to how it hears. Since the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace, verse 18. In Exodus chapter 23 verse 12 and 13 the Sabbath is mentioned as a time of rest not only for the people, but also for the animals which served them, and that the son of thy handmaid and the stranger may be refreshed. The land was to enjoy its Sabbaths as a constant token that it belonged to the Lord, so that not only man, but the land itself, the poor and the beasts of the field were to share God's rest. All were the objects of God's tender compassion. With the Sabbath, there is also the mention of three feasts, which, in their typical meaning, are of the first importance to us. In Leviticus chapter 23 the full range of Jehovah's feasts is brought before us, typical of the ways of God in blessing from the cross to the millennium, but in this chapter only three of the feasts. In addition to the Sabbath, are mentioned. Firstly, there is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the Passover, see Exodus chapter 12 verse 8, Luke chapter 22 verse 1. Unleavened bread was a necessary accompaniment to the Passover. Then we have the Feast of Harvest, and the Feast of Ingathering, Exodus chapter 23 verse 16. On these three occasions, the Passover, Pentecost and the Feast of Tabernacles, all the males of Israel were to appear before God. As in Leviticus chapter 23, so it is here, the Sabbath is first mentioned as setting forth the consummation of all God's ways in blessing for all his redeemed, whether heavenly or earthly. When they shall share with him his eternal rest. Where deceiver ne'er can enter, sin-soiled feet have never trod, free, our peaceful feet may venture in the paradise of God. How appropriate that the Sabbath, with its prospect of eternal rest, should have precedence over the other feasts, and as indicating the divine order attaching to them. The Feast of Unleavened Bread necessarily follows, which speaks of the setting aside of all that is of the flesh, that in which God can find no pleasure. Whether it be the leaven of the Pharisees which is religious pretension, the leaven of the Sadducees which is intellectualism and infidelity, the old leaven which belongs to man after the flesh ended in the cross. Or the leaven of malice and wickedness which is the fruit of the old nature, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 6 to 8. We can only celebrate this feast with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, and having Christ before us, as the true Passover apart from whom there could be no harvest, and without whom we should appear in God's presence empty. We have much to offer in praise and thanksgiving. Then comes the feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labors which thou hast sown in the field. In Leviticus chapter 23, where these feasts are mentioned in greater detail. The sheaf of first fruits, which was waved before the Lord, is typical of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. He is the beginning of the true harvest. First born from among the dead, the beginning in resurrection of a new order of things which has sprung up from the corn of wheat that fell into the ground and died. It had been written, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy, and how glorious are the achievements resulting from the sufferings of the cross. And by the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost to form a heavenly company, who are all of one with him, his joy and boast. It was, in view of the joy lying before him, he, endured the cross, having despised the shame, and now he, is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2. The feast of ingathering follows, which has in view the gathering in of the children of Israel, but which in its comprehensive application embraces the myriads of the redeemed of every age and dispensation. All for God has been established in resurrection, the first fruits, Christ, then those that are the Christ's at his coming, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 23.
this wonderful ingathering commenced at Pentecost by the descent of the Holy Spirit. A moral order is discernible in these feasts. As we enter into the truth of that which is set forth in the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Harvest, we are prepared to enter into the fullness of blessing which God has purposed for his people set forth in the Feast of Ingathering. With the inheritance in its vast extent, from the wilderness unto the river, Exodus chapter 23 verse 31. Israel will have this inheritance in the mediatorial kingdom of the Lord Jesus, in a scene where righteousness reigns. During the Lord's reign he will annul, all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he put all enemies under his feet. At the end he will give up the kingdom to him, who is God and Father. That God may be all in all, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 24 to 28. It is to this we are hastening, the full fruition, the perfect realization of every thought of God. As lifted above our own feebleness of thought, may we, as endowed by the Spirit, with ever enlarging capacity seek to apprehend the fullness of God's thought for the blessing of men. Founded on the redemptive work of Christ, and reaching its blessed consummation in the new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwells righteousness, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 13. Then too will be fulfilled the scripture, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall tabernacle with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, the God, Revelation chapter 21 verse 3. In Exodus chapter 24 we have presented to us what is commonly spoken of as the ratification of the covenant. In the chapters we have already considered there has been, in the most solemn manner, the unfolding of the terms, and their interpretation, on which God's relationship with his people could be maintained, according to the inflexible demands of righteousness and holiness. The first verse intimates the solemnity of the occasion, yet with all array of divine grace, worthy of the God of all grace, illumines that somber scene. Moses was instructed to bring others with him, but Jehovah said, Let Moses alone come near Jehovah, but they shall not come near. Neither shall the people go up with him. In these words we are again reminded of the character of the dispensation, one of distance, as distinctly emphasized in the words. And worship afar off. This is in marked contrast to the spirit of the present dispensation in which we are exhorted, let us approach with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22. In choosing that Moses alone should draw near to him, we see a singular act of God's grace in investing Moses with the high honor and dignity of mediator of the covenant. Grace alone conferred this dignity, and its significance and importance lie in the fact that Moses, in type, displays in shadowy outline the more substantial and positive glories of an infinitely greater mediator, even, Jesus. Mediator of a new covenant, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 24, 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5. He is that mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, one who in the power of his own shed blood, entered in once for all into the Holy of Holies. Having found an eternal redemption, who by the eternal Spirit offered himself spotless to God, and for this reason he is mediator of a new covenant, Hebrews chapter 9 verses 12 to 15. Having regard to the solemn incident mentioned in Leviticus chapter 10, where Nadab and Abihu took each of them his censer, and put fire in it, and put incense on it, and presented strange fire before Jehovah, which he had not commanded them, the solemn character of their offense is intensified when we observe that they were included among that favored company who saw the God of Israel. Yet in the exercise of their priestly functions they acted in complete disregard of that which was pleasurable to God and thereby brought upon themselves the summary judgment of God. It is of prime importance that we have our attention drawn to the judgment that fell upon the sons of Aaron, and that we should profit from its solemn admonition. Since all around us today we see the increasing prevalence of the mind of man intruding with daring presumption into the holy things of God. Ignorant or forgetful of the fact that he has to do with God who has declared, I will be hallowed in them that come near me, and before all the people I will be glorified, Leviticus chapter 10 verse 3. What is rendered to God must be in accordance with his desires, as that which is the fruit of the Spirit's work in our souls. When Moses came to the people and told them, all the words of Jehovah, and all the judgments, all the people replied, with one voice, and said, all the words that Jehovah has said will we do. Moses then recorded all these words in a book, spoken of in Exodus chapter 24 verse 7 as the book of the covenant, and referred to in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 19 as the book itself. It was according to the terms recorded in this book that covenant relations were to be established and maintained.
how significant and precious in its typical teaching is the action of Moses in rising up early in the morning and building an altar under the mountain, and twelve pillars. According to the twelve tribes of Israel, it is remarkable that in Exodus chapter 20, after God had given the Ten Commandments, he immediately speaks of the altar, and of burnt offerings and peace offerings. So it is in this chapter. As often reiterated, God's desire is to dwell with his people, but this could not be realized on the ground of the obedience of man after the flesh. But by the obedience of the true mediator even unto death, and that the death of the cross. A death in which he glorified God and laid the righteous basis upon which will be fully realized the eternal gratification of the heart of God in blessing to men. In the Twelve Pillars, according to the Twelve Tribes of Israel, we are reminded of God's unwavering purpose to bless the people, not on the ground of the declared obedience, but wholly in virtue of the sacrificial work of Christ of which the altar typically speaks. In the mind of God the blessing of his people would be secured in all the value and sweet savour of the burnt offering, and it is worthy of note that, before the covenant was ratified, the people were identified with the altar and so brought on to that ground by the work of the mediator. How precious is the typical significance of these things as pointing forward to the work of him who is the true mediator, and who was himself the true burnt offering. Through Christ's death God has been glorified as to all the breakdown under the first covenant, and his people have been identified with the work which has glorified him. And also with the person who has wrought this great work. A new order is suggested in the youths of the children of Israel offering up burnt offerings, and sacrificing sacrifices of peace offerings of bullocks to Jehovah, Exodus chapter 24 verse 5. In this we have a new generation intimated. The youths, in contrast to the elders, of verse 1. By the sovereign work of God there will be a new generation of Israel with the law written in their hearts. Instead of fathers who utterly failed under law. There will be sons in whose hearts the Spirit of grace has wrought, and who will be taught of God. Of these we read in Psalm chapter 45 verse 16. Instead of thy fathers shall be thy sons, and this new generation is also spoken of in Psalm chapter 22 verse 31 and Psalm chapter 110 verse 3. How precious too is all this in its application to the saints in the present dispensation of grace who are sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus, for God sent forth his Son, that we might receive sonship. As another has said, it is receiving the position of sonship as a gift. Backquote received, has an active force here. Jew and Gentile received it as a gift from another, even freely from God, for the Jew was in bondage under law. The Gentile has right to nothing. It is because we are sons that God has sent out the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Galatians chapter 4 verse 6. See also Romans chapter 8 verses 15, 23, and Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5. We are also children of God by divine generation, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the living and abiding word of God. But this is the word which in the glad tidings is preached to you, 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 23 to 25. Moreover, it is said of those so richly blessed that they are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. By sanctification of the Spirit unto the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2. The obedience spoken of here is in strong contrast to the legal obedience demanded under law. Those born of incorruptible seed are children of obedience, being partakers of a divine nature which delights in obedience. Having the spirit of sonship they are competent to obey as Christ obeyed. And by that same spirit they are accepted before God in all the value of the sprinkling of the blood of that Lamb, foreknown. Indeed before the foundation of the world. The words just quoted from Peter's first epistle are a direct allusion to Exodus chapter 24 verses 6-8. As are also the words of Hebrews chapter 9 verses 19 to 20, which in greater detail recall the action of Moses in sprinkling the blood as he was commanded. In Hebrews chapter 9 we find an interesting and instructive addition to that which is recorded in Exodus, that the book also was sprinkled, as well as the altar and the people. We might well ask, what does the sprinkling of blood in this case speak of? It is certainly not redemption, since we have already considered the types which set forth redemption in its twofold aspect, first, by blood according to Exodus chapter 12, which sheltered them from the judgment of God, secondly, by power, as witnessed by their triumphant passage through the Red Sea, whereby their enemies were destroyed and they were delivered forever from their power. 
Israel now, at a distance from God, standing on the ground of their responsibility before God, having pledged themselves to unqualified obedience to the terms of the covenant, are made to realize their solemn position by the sealing of this covenant by blood. The sprinkling of blood here is not propitiation, but penalty, the blood signifying that death is the penal sanction of the law. By the sprinkling of blood, Israel bound themselves to keep the whole law in a covenant of death. Nor is it otherwise, in this day of grace with those who in principle make the ground of law their rule of life, who are trusting to the good works as the condition of blessing. Though ignorant of this solemn fact, they are truly placing themselves under the curse of the law to which death is attached as the penalty of disobedience. The witness of death is deeply imprinted on this chapter. The blood was sprinkled on the altar, speaking typically of that work by which God has been glorified. Christ died under the solemn curse of a broken law, thereby establishing the will of God in a path of unswerving obedience to that will which led only to the cross. Where the authority of the law was maintained and every penalty of its infraction borne. The blood was also sprinkled on the people as speaking to their consciences, and ours, in type of that sacrifice of nobler name, by which Christ has become the mediator of a new covenant, so that death having taken place for redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, the called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance, Heb. 9.15. From Hebrews chapter 9 verse 19 we learn that the blood was also sprinkled on, the book. Would not this typically intimate that every claim of the first covenant has been righteously met? And that its righteous demands have been completely vindicated by the full penalty being borne? In that death there has also been the setting aside of the man who was unable to meet the righteous requirements of the law. The children of Israel were unable to see Christ as the end of all this typical teaching, but, as taught by grace, we see that this blessed one was in the mind of God from the very beginning. In Exodus chapter 24 verses 9 to 11 a most momentous spectacle is opened before us. Two of its features will serve to justify the truth of this assertion, they saw the God of Israel, and, they saw God, and ate and drank. God distinctly declared in Exodus chapter 33 verse 20. Thou canst not see my face, for man shall not see me, and live. Yet here, through special grace granted on the ground of that blood sprinkling that had just taken place, Moses and his companions, as representatives of the people, went up and ate and drank in the presence of the God of Israel. Although they were in the presence of the holy God of Israel, God did not place his hand in judgment on the nobles, who saw, under his feet as it were work of transparent sapphire, and as it were the form of heaven for clearness. All this was in accordance with the dispensation of law. How surpassingly great is the glory of the grace displayed in the person of Jesus, who was none other than Jehovah, the God of Israel, veiling the glory of deity in a body specially prepared for him in which he passed through this world in all the attractive grace and moral excellence of perfect manhood. As has been written, in his humiliation his divine glory was maintained in the unsounded depths of his person, and a scripture says, in him all the fullness of the Godhead was pleased to dwell, Colossians chapter 1 verse 19. In the Gospels we see the God of Israel in Jesus, allowing men to eat and drink in his presence, and we also see him eating and drinking with his disciples, with Pharisees and with publicans and sinners. Peter, in Acts chapter 10 verses 40 to 41, also mentions the grace that allowed the disciples to eat and drink with Jesus, where he says, This man, God raised up the third day and gave him to be openly seen. Not of all the people, but of witnesses who were chosen before of God, us who have eaten and drunk with him after he arose from among the dead. How surpassing to the grace that allowed that poor penitent woman in the Pharisee's house to wash his blessed feet with tears, to wipe them with her hair, and to kiss and anoint them with the ointment she had brought. Immeasurable grace indeed. At the close of the chapter we find Moses in his place of mediator, called by God to come up to me, that he might receive from him, the tables of stone, and the law, and the commandment that I have written. For their instruction, the solemnity of the occasion is marked by, the appearance of the glory of Jehovah, being, like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain before the eyes of the children of Israel. Moses was alone with God forty days and forty nights. And as mediator he alone could approach God to receive from him the tables of stone, the living oracles, of which Stephen spoke in Acts 7. The glory seen by the children of Israel was not the glory of God's grace, but the glory of holiness as befitting the age of law.
in measureless grace it is given to us now to behold the glory of the grace that shines resplendent in the face of Jesus, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18.